Yeah, you turn around and meet someone, would you? Just talk to them a minute. So part of what tonight's all about is getting to know other people. All right, guys, looking pretty good, looking pretty good. A um, little housekeeping before we get started to kind of give you guys a little bit of vision uh, concerning what all of the men's and women's gatherings have been about in the spring. It's kind of getting us to a place of uh, getting to know other people. And then in the fall, we have another design plan to... Uh, create mosaic groups, you know, they're called so many different things, people have all these different names for them, but uh, creating small group opportunities for people to get to know each other, and uh, a big part of doing life, doing church, is not just what we know, but who we know, and, and having relationships with people that uh, challenge us, encourage us, and so uh, in your seat, there is a, a servant leader card, would you grab that right now? And do me a favor, uh, I want to take just a minute, and, and on here, if, if you're willing in the fall for you and your spouse, uh, uh, Susan will be doing this as well, um, if you're willing to lead a, a small group at your home or an, just an interest group, please fill this out. I want everybody to fill it out anyway, and, uh, and, and that's one question, are you willing to lead a group? The other question is, is if you are not currently serving at Mosaic Church, I want to ask you, and I don't want you to do it under pressure or duress, but if you're not serving, I'd really like for you to consider serving in, in some capacity as an usher, greeter, parking lot attendant, prayer partner, whatever it might be. Um, you know, guys, a lot of people sit on the sidelines of life and never do anything. And when they don't do anything, they don't help anybody change. I'm here tonight because I want to invest in people. I want to invest in you. I want to invest in those watching online. So if you'd fill that out, we'll uh, take that in just a little bit because it wouldn't be church without receiving an offering. So if we receive an offering, you drop that in. It also gives you a way to fake giving something. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, teaching us. And uh, it is important that we learn. And uh, tonight, I pray that what we learn, we will be able to apply, not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And so, God, that we just open our hearts now as we open our ears to hear your word, that the seed of your word would be sown deep in our hearts and produce much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. The last men's breakfast, I began talking to you guys about how we think. And I'm real big on creating uh, my thoughts so that I can create the life that I want to live. And if we don't create right thoughts, we won't live the right kind of life. And it goes back to that famous scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, okay? And we typically will live the way we think. I was talking to, uh, actually talking to Mark today, and there's a book that he suggested, and I'm going to get it and, and look at it, look it over, but he said this guy was a paratrooper, Navy SEAL, yada, yada, the list goes on, an overachiever. And he said, by the time you're ready to quit, by the time you're ready to quit something, you've only exercised or utilized 30% of your willpower by the time you're ready to quit. So most people quit before they've even crossed a halfway point of trying. And the reason that we quit is because we think we can't go any further. How many people say, I could never do that again, I can't, I can't do it, I, don't, I mean, I've exp I have done everything that I can do, and, and the question I would ask is, have, have we really, when we say that, have we done everything we can do, or have we just decided to give up? And I think most of the time, we just decide to give up, and a lot of people are, are just steps away from beginning to live the dream they've dreamed of before they, they quit, they, they just quit. Uh, I, I'm going to mess this story up, but it was some years ago I read an article about, uh, I don't know if it was a man or woman, swimming the English Channel, and it got foggy, and I think it was a lady, she was going to be the first lady to swim the English Channel, and she got really tired, and she had her team with her, and uh, she said, I can't take it anymore, 
and uh, you know get me out of the water. So they pull her out of the water, and they were literally just feet from from the the, the bank on the other side. And she had lost sight, lost vision, and lost hope in her thinking, and and gave up prematurely. Now she would later go back and swim it. But uh, how many people in life have been right to that place where you you had no idea you were about to get promoted and, and you quit your job a week early because you're you're frustrated. And so we allow oftentimes allow our frustrations, our anger, our bitterness, whatever it might be, uh, to help make those decisions for us without really thinking about it and praying about it. So we're going to talk about possibility thinking. Now, this was something back 20, 30 years ago that if you start talking about possibility thinking, thinking Norman Vincent Peale, and, and there were so many others that uh, created this, this possibility thinking idea. And a lot of Christians uh, didn't like it because they felt like it was a pie-in-the-sky teaching. The reality is that Jesus was probably a probability thinker, and uh, we, we need to be at least possibility thinkers. And so I want to challenge us tonight, just in the next 30 minutes or so, how to become a, a person who thinks that really all things are possible with God. And uh, if you grew up in a home with any kind of negativity, uh, any kind of doubt, self-defeated, uh, this will be revolutionary for you, as it was for me. Uh, I grew up in a survivor's home that uh, we were always going to do enough to survive. And that was about as hard as we were going to push, and that was we're going to survive. We're going to be very uh, careful, and uh, we're not really going to uh, necessarily believe that all things are possible, but, but we do believe God will meet every need we have according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that belief system because it's in the Bible and believing that scripture, but can you believe beyond that that God can do more than we can think or imagine, imagine nothing's impossible with God. And so survivor thinking looks to Scripture that says, well, you know, God's going to meet my need. But then it, we don't look at, if I give, it'll be given good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You see what I'm saying? So it, 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 a lot of people believe Scripture at its minimum instead of its maximum. Because if you're going to believe the Bible at its maximum and all the things it says, it will require a lot more faith and a lot more action. So it, going to heaven's easy. You guys have heard me say this a million times. Going to heaven's easy. Jesus paid the price. It'd be like if I told you tonight, hey, when we we're done, go next door to Incredible Pizza and eat. I've already paid. All you've got to do is get your body over to Incredible Pizza, get a plate, get a tray, and go through the line. Can I tell you something? Unless you're hungry, you won't even go over there. Even though it's paid for, you won't go over there. A lot of people don't realize the price has been paid, but they won't even get up and go get what Jesus has for them. Go after it. Because it takes work. It takes being intentional. So possibility thinking begins with this. And, and if you're taking notes, Numbers 1330, you'll remember the story of, of the spies going into the promised land. One of my favorite Old Testament stories because you had a bunch of people who followed the same God, they heard all the same stories, uh, they were from similar tribes, they were all from Israel, from different tribes in Israel, they all had all of these things in common, and yet, they had different perspectives. And, and I'll get to this as we read this, you'll see the one perspective, and you'll recognize it if you've been in church any time at all, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses, okay? You remember they kept, the spies came back and said, we can't go in there. We're like grasshoppers to them. So the size of the people that inhabited the land of promise was what they saw instead of seeing the promise. They saw the obstacles, the size of the people, instead of the size of the promise. God's promise is there to help us have the courage to overshadow the problems and the people in our lives. And so I want to encourage us as we go through this tonight, and again, if you're not writing these things down, I would write them down because these are the things that if you take them home and you meditate on them day and night, these are based on Scripture. And I don't know how many of you, I have things on my walls 
in, in my gym that I look at, and I'll sometimes just go over and look at them and meditate to remind me what's possible. What's possible? Feel the energy of possibility thinking, okay? Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now, I'm going to ask you, the Bible tells us, what made Caleb strong enough to stand up in the midst of 10 other guys who had already given Moses a negative report that here are all the reasons we can't do this. And you have one guy who stands up and he says he quieted the crowd. Now, let me tell you something. People who say nothing align themselves with the people who are talking because you say nothing. So when we sit around and listen to negativity, even though you may not talk negative, you automatically, in the midst of people, align yourself with that negativity. You hear people say, hey, I didn't say anything. You're right, you didn't, and you probably should have. You see what I'm saying? Caleb could have said, well, you know what? They may not go to the land, but I'm going to sneak out and I'm going to go myself because we're going to make this happen. I'm going to go anyway. The idea of possibility thinking is believing that truly with God, nothing is impossible. And you can actually feel this energy coming from people that believe this way. Leaders who embrace possibility thinking are capable of co accomplishing tasks that most people consider impossible. Several reasons why we should become possibility thinkers, and these are the ones I think are critical to how you're going to think and how I'm going to think. Because I grew up with a great, hardworking dad, but he had very limited thinking. His thoughts were, I'm going to build my home on my little piece of earth, I'm going to work hard to maintain that home, and I'm going to die in that home. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. And, man, he was a great man, loved him, but I kept believing beyond that. And it didn't make me better than him. It just I just couldn't live under the lid of that kind of thinking. So today I'd ask you, where is the lid in your life? What, what is the lid in your life? What is it that keeps you from self-destruction or that keeps you in the mode of self-destruction? What is the lid holding you down? I don't have enough education. I don't have enough experience. I don't have this. I don't have. And you can give 10 reasons why you can't do something, but you can't give one reason why you can. And we have to start removing the lid off of our lives, and you remove the lid off your life by first how you think. So possibility thinking opens up other possibilities for you. Because now you start looking out into all the different things you can do and the ways you can do them, and, and you start dreaming, if you will. You start having vision, if you will. You start seeing possibilities happen. And, and nothing's happened physically, but in your heart and mind, you begin to see what that might be like if. It, it looks like a risk, and oftentimes it is a risk. But you will never experience all that there is or all that God has for you to experience if you don't believe God beyond what you're capable of. Because if all you do is what you're capable of, then God's not involved in what you're doing. Okay, that's strong. Then God is only involved up to that point. <laughs> but if you and I only do what we're capable of doing, then why do I need God in that? If I'm skilled at something and I'm good at something and I say, this, I'm good at this, God, I got this, God says, but I have more for you. If we don't cross the line of our own capacity and capability, then why would God get involved? Without faith, we can't please him. And so we need to open our thought life to different possibilities. Number two, possibility thinking attracts other possibility thinkers to you. In other words, as a, as a pastor, I've gone to conferences all over the world, spoken at conferences all over the world, and I've been around some of the, 
what I consider to be the greatest leaders in the world. And uh, the, the conclusion, when you're building a church, you, you oftentimes say, well, what part of town do I want to build a church in? And, and, and then you, you ask the question, why do I want to build the church in that part of town? And then some people would say, well, I want to build it because these are the kinds of people I want to attract. Well, you can market, you can plant your church or your business in that side of town. Here's the reality. You don't attract the people you want. You attract the people you are. The people that are going to be a part of your world are not going to be the people you want. They're going to be people like you. So, in other words, if you want, I want positive people who are givers. Guess what? You better be a positive person who's a giver. That's who you're going to attract. But if you say, well, you know, I, I, that's not who I am, but those are the people I want. Good luck. It won't work. So, we attract who we are. Please realize that. So, if you say, man, I, all my friends are negative, you're probably negative too. Because you attracted that group of people to you. You won't find people around me typically that are negative because it just doesn't work because I'm positive. Now, it doesn't make me better. Again, I'm just telling you that that's how I live my life. That's how I've lived my life. And that I believe nothing is impossible with God. And, and I, I had to learn that. I had to overcome uh, a very small-minded mindset in a community in which I grew up that the idea was that we're all just going to grow old here and we're going to die. Well, you know what? I haven't planned on where I'm dying yet. That's up to God. And I'm not real sure. I have some ideas where I want to die. I want you to bury me on the sand, not in red dirt. Now, I know some people want to be buried in red dirt. God bless you. Go for it. I'm just saying when you start dreaming, you say, I can't see outside of here. This has been your world. Or, and that's great. I love Oklahoma City. I love Oklahoma people. There's nobody better in the world. But we don't have an ocean here. So someday that's where I want to be. And, and so I, I make no apology for it. It's, it's what I want. Now, I'm going to tell you, as far as I know, my dad and mother went to one beach their whole life, and that was Galveston. And it's hideous. Who would go back to the beach if you went to Galveston? And if you have a place there, I apologize, kind of, but not really. It's just gross. And so you go, well, you know, so why would you? If you've never gone, you've never stepped outside your comfort zone, you have removed yourself from thinking all things are possible. And that's what I want to get us to. All things are possible. Number three, possibility thinking creates new opportunities for you. You want to know why? Maybe you haven't had opportunities. I have people say, well, you know, I just don't have any opportunities. What are you doing to create them? You know, when I look around here tonight, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, I applaud you guys. You made it, you're making an investment in your time. See, some people don't think time like this is worth it. Well, I got better things to do. Yeah, you, as you sit home, drink suds and watch something stupid on TV. And I'm talking to you. Anyway, so, no, the reality is what do you want? When I say make an investment in yourself, that's what I'm talking about. I, I can give you, you walk away from here tonight with 10 points, and I promise you, you're going to be a better person tomorrow if you look at them and apply them. It's real simple. You know, the question nowadays is, well, why do we need to go to church? We have YouTube. We have everything we have at our fingertips right here on the iPhone. You may tell you why, because most people will not watch anything that's going to change their life, and they won't give their time and attention to anything that's going to change their life. They'll watch stupid snippet videos that they'll laugh at, and we ought to all laugh. You guys know I like to laugh. But the reality is I also like to grow, and the only way you grow is by what you know. Whatever you know is what feeds what you grow. So if you know the Bible, you get the seed of the Word, or you get positive thinking or possibility thinking in you, it begins to change how you live, not just how you think. How you think is going to be how you live. So, number four, possibility thinking gives you energy. Have you ever been around some, there are two kinds of people, by the way, people energized and people drained. There are people who will drain you and there are people who energize you. Ask yourself the question, which one am I? Do I energize people or do I drain people? And do I hang around with people who energize me or do I hang around with people who drain me? Man, I, I can't hang around with people who drain me. Well, you know, 
I'm just sure not, not much is going to happen. You know, before I started Mosaic, one of my friends, I, I call him, he said, well, you know, Mark, you could probably go back to Oklahoma City and start a church, but it would only be two or 300. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And when this thing hits 1,000, I'm going to call him and say, I want, to, I want you to come and visit the little church you prophesied over. Dummy. <laughs> if I'd have listened to him, I wouldn't even have started a church. But I'm a dreamer. More importantly, I'm obedient to God. I'm not perfect, but I'm obedient to God. If God says do something, it goes against the grain of everything I believe. I'm going to do it anyway because he sees from a perspective I don't see. And what I have learned is when you obey God, everything always turns out all right. I've obeyed the Lord before, and I went, God, a month in, six months in, this just doesn't look good. (laughs) This just doesn't seem right. But here I am. God says, you ain't seen nothing yet. We just quit too early sometimes because our thinking begins to stink, and it becomes stinking thinking. And somebody will, I tell you, if you, if you have one negative word to say, you can get 10 people to agree with you, 10 out of 10. You have one positive word, and you'll have a hard time getting two out of 10. And that's what happened to Caleb. Caleb, 12 spies go in. And I don't, I mean, I know Joshua, you know, he's got a book named after him. I don't know why Caleb doesn't. If I was Caleb, I'd be talking to God saying, I'm the one that silenced the crowd, and he gets a book named after him. What's up with that? Because I looked at Joshua, and I went, Joshua just went, I think I'm going to agree with him. But Caleb's the one that spoke up. Ten other spies said, no, we can't do this. We look like grasshoppers. Folks, let me tell you, it takes courage to be the one voice or the second voice or the third voice out of 12 people to stand up and say, this is what we're going to do. How are you going to do it? I don't know. God said do it. This is what we're supposed to do. And so possibility thinking creates new opportunities for you, and it, it gives you energy. I want you to start measuring your day for the next for the rest of the month, just say, okay, do I have a positive day or a negative day? If you say, I had a negative day, ask yourself why. Then write down the people you were around. And if it's your wife, she doesn't count. Because you're stuck, brother. <laughs> but you've got to ask yourself the question, why do I feel drained at the end of these days? And I'm just going to tell you right now, at my age, I would tell you, if you are drained Monday through Friday and you're at a job, You might want to start thinking, this job is literally killing me. What can I do if I'm supposed to be here? What can I do to create energy? Because there is no energy coming to me. You can create your own energy by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can create your own energy. The point I'm trying to make is you need energy to live a happy, healthy, whole life. You and I need it. And we have to produce it, okay? Number five, possibility thinking keeps you from giving up. Keeps you from quitting. It keeps you from listening to naysayers that say it'll never happen, can't happen. Challenge in our world is news is everywhere. And news stations and news outlets make their living creating fear thinking. Fear paralyzes. Not totally, it's partial paralysis, but it it paralyzes. And we make decisions based on negative information coming through those outlets. Now, again, I'm not trying to throw any news outlet under the bus. That's not my, my plan or my point. But the re- it's a reality. It's all about money and what we can sell and creating controversy and conflict. It's how Hollywood makes movies. If you look at all the things that is necessary for a movie to succeed, a part of it is conflict, provocation, that, that to keep it interested and keep it moving. And so... To keep America uh, 
kind of under control, the whole idea, and this is why, and I'm going to go out on a limb, and I know that we're, we're, we're live stream right now, but the idea of a socialistic government is for a few people to tell everybody else how dumb they are. It's what socialism is. Capitalism says we think we ought to live in a country where everybody has a chance to make as much money as they want and do what they want. Socialism says y'all are too dumb to know what you want to do and too dumb to do it. So we're going to give you this much money. We're going to put this much lid on you. Everybody's going to eat and everybody's going to live, but you're going to do it our way. That's oppression. And if our country, and I'll be dead before this happens or else I'll move to another country. Because I can't live under that. You know, we weren't born to live under that. I mean, if you look at all God created, we're creating the image and likeness of God. And the creative power that created the heavens and earth created us. Therefore, you have a creativity in your DNA. The challenge is we don't exercise that creativity because we're told that we shouldn't. You know, just, just get along, just comply. And I'm not saying we rebel, but I'm saying there has to be a revolution in our soul for us to be everything that God wants us to be, we have to challenge the status quo. Number six, possibility thinking actually creates possibility for others. You know, one of the reasons I was glad to come back wasn't for me at all. My life has been given to helping people see beyond their crisis beyond their own capacity, beyond their own capabilities, that somebody told them, you will never exceed this. You will never go beyond this. And let me tell you the ten reasons you never will. First off, your IQ is not high enough. You didn't have a high enough ACT score. And, 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 and you know, alcoholism runs in our family. And, uh, and, and diabetes runs in our family. And, and, and the list goes on. Of all the reasons you can't do what you aspire to do. And you just have to look and say, you know what? I'll die trying. I'll never forget when I was running across America in 1990. Literally running across America. I started in Tulsa, so halfway across America. It felt like across America. I ran 3,000 miles in 11 months. But I ran 90, in 98 days, I ran 1,500 of those miles. And I'll never forget one day I was in perfect shape. I was 4% body fat. I could run 17 miles eating a cheeseburger. It was nothing. I did it every day. And one day I, I, I felt like I needed it. We were trying to, I had to be at the White House. I had to be in Washington, D.C. to meet with the president's aides in 1990 and, and, and uh, his cabinet. And just, it was, it was a run for life. It was a pro-life rally run. It was uh, it, it, just what it was. And, and one day I thought, man, we're, we're behind. So I, me and one other guy were running it. We had a support team that drove behind us, and we ran 17 miles a day. And uh, one day we hit 28 miles. We were behind. I ran 28. And then one day we were, we were about to Washington, D.C. We were doing interviews and television, radio all along the way. And we were coming in. Uh, to, we, had an, we had an appointment at the White House, and we had to, we had to be there. There was no, how many of you don't, you don't call the White House and say, can we move that meeting till tomorrow? And so I said, well, we got to get there. So that particular day. Finally, I've never done it since, never done it before, ran 42 miles. Now, this, this is how God works. This is just so I wouldn't be arrogant. So I, I run 42 miles. I'm exhausted. And, and uh, get up the next morning, and I'm reading USA Today. That was back in the days before these. <laughs> and, you know, the hard copy. And there were all these sections of interest. And one of them was somebody had done an ultra marathon and ran 62. And I went, thanks, God. <laughs> really? You have to let me see that now. I thought I'd done pretty well, and somebody so far did outdid me. But you know what that did for me? I thought if, if I did 42, I could do 62. And, and so what happens is that, that if we read the right things and we submit our minds to the right things, we will do more things than we've ever done. But we have to increase our capacity. You cannot pour a 32-ounce Coke in a 16-ounce Sprite bottle. But you got 32 ounces of Coke, you need to transfer somewhere because it's leaking. You have to find a place of capacity to pour that into. And the challenge with that is sometimes people say, I forget it, 16 ounces will work for me. That's how most people think. 16-ounce thinking when you got 32 ounces in you. 
And you have to say, no, you know what? I think I'm going to find another 32-ounce bottle, so I'm going to start looking for 64-ounce capacity. Possibility thinking creates capacity in your soul that causes you to stop thinking about reduction and start thinking about increase. And let me tell you something. Increase comes with challenge, but challenge comes with the power of God because he's the one that enables it. But let me tell you, it'll cause you some pain. 42 miles, a lot more painful than 17. I guarantee you. But it made me believe in something I'd never believed in before, that I could do more than I thought I could do. You can do more than you think you can do. You can tolerate more than you think you can tolerate. How many of your parents, when you were kids, my mother said, I can't put up with any more. What she was really saying was, I'm going to beat the crap out of you in about five minutes. That, and the hope was by saying that, that we would be scared into submission. We were boys. Are you kidding me? Swing the belt, Mama. Then she got smart. She said, when your dad gets home, that changed everything for me. Because <laughs> he could swing a belt. But my weak little 5'3", Mama, I thought, swing away, baby. We need to increase our capacity. That's what possibility thinking does. It increases capacity. Number seven, and when you do that, guess what? It will also increase capacity in others. That's what that guy did for me who ran 60-some miles while I ran 42. He increased my capacity. (laughs) Have I done that? No, and I won't, but I know I could if I worked at it. And I may do that someday. I actually at one point said I want to run from Oklahoma to California just so I can say I ran the whole United States. Now I'm at an age right now where they'd probably have an ambulance running behind me, but anyway. (laughs) Number seven, possibility thinking allows you to dream big dreams. Big dreams. It's been rare that I've ever seen God do more than what we ask him to do or believe that he will do. Could he do more? Absolutely. It says he's able to do more than we can think or imagine according to the power that works in us. So God's looking at our capacity saying, I've got this much. What do you have? Remember the story of the woman with the vases? She's about to die and, 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 and our jars. And, and the, the prophet said, go get jars and, and take the little bit of oil you have and start filling them. And you remember once she filled all the jars, the, the oil stopped flowing. The capacity was determined by the number of jars that she put in the house If she'd have put 12 more jars in that house, the oil would have kept flowing. She determined the capacity by the number of jars she put in her house. I am absolutely convinced that woman could have started a refinery if she'd have had the faith. Now, she had enough faith to go get those jars, so I'm not being critical. And it was enough to save her children and her. But what if she could have seen beyond that and said, this, this... Go get more jars. I don't want this oil to stop flowing. What would have happened? We determine the capacity that allows God, and this a lot of religious people would hate this, that allows God to be God. Now, we know he's God, but to do what only God can do is determined by our capacity to receive what God can do, which is beyond what we can think or imagine. So I want to ask you to start thinking of ways to increase your capacity, and that begins by how you think. Number eight, possibility thinking makes it possible to rise above average. To rise above average. Now, this is a little risky because there are two movies that are real similar. Uh, One movie is, uh, I believe it's entitled, What a Girl Wants. The other is What a Woman Wants with Mel Gibson, which I think that one's real risque. But the one one is a a really kind of an interesting movie, and and some of you, I've I've shared this story before, is that this girl uh, grows up with her mother, single home. She never knew who her dad was. Her mother kept her, I think it was in New York. And her dad, come to find out, lived in, in, in England, and he was royalty. She had no idea. When she got old enough, she wanted to meet her dad. She wanted to meet him. Well, she had been brought up 
with a, a creative, artsy mother that, that just survived and, you know, loved, loved life but didn't, didn't have much capacity. And she grew up with that. Well, she goes to meet her dad, long story short, finds out he's royalty. And she meets a British kid about her age, a good-looking guy, a young man. And, and uh, he's, like, freaked out by the way she thinks because she's not thinking like a child of royalty. This is a challenge with Christians. We don't think like children of royalty. We don't see our, our lineage, our bloodline through the Bible. We see it through our mom or our dad, our natural parents. And thank God for natural parents because I am a natural parent. But I want my kids, I always wanted my kids to see beyond my capacity, my ability to see what God could do. So that he's royalty. Nothing is impossible with God. And so one day she's, she's uh, always trying to fit in. She never wanted anybody to see her as the daughter of this, this royal whatever he was. I think king was becoming king of this whatever. Uh, and this young man looked at her and he said, why do you try so hard to fit in? When you were born to stand out. You will be criticized. When possibility thinking. Becomes reality living. You will be criticized. I don't get near as much criticism. In a small church as I did a big church. Not even close. Because people could care less. But when you start finding success. You will find critics. When you find success you will find critics, not just critics, a multitude of critics. You know why? Because most people live an average life and hate it when you exceed average because when you do, you raise the bar. And when you raise the bar, it says to them, I did it, you can do it, but you're too lazy to do it. That's what it says to them. That's not what you're saying. But what it says to them, when somebody exceeds average, it forces everybody else to look in the mirror at themselves because everybody sees the difference in above average and average. Okay? So it, it raises the bar and it creates this contrast, this chasm, this gap between somebody who says, I'm going to do more. It's, you know, when, when, I, uh, when I started working for the phone company, Man, I, it was the best job I'd ever had. I never had out of high school a really great job. And all of a sudden, I this was back when AT&T was really good. Salvation Bell, really good. You know, this was before all the cell phones. And I was put in this crew. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I'd worked inside with Salvation Bell. I'd been in the offices and wanted to go outside and be a part of outdoor, the, what they call plant, where, you know, you're installing phones and cables and all that stuff outdoors. I'm an outdoors guy. I can't stand being inside. And so I... Uh, I was a new guy. I was in training. I had to go to school for all the electronics and all that stuff. And so I go to school. I come back. And so they ease you into it um, because they're, you know, we had mobile homes which uh, carry electricity. A lot of people die. And you get up on uh, climbing poles and your, your umbrella gets up into electric. People die. So you, you got to really, it's kind of a risky, a little bit of a risky job. And, and so they put you on what, uh, at that time, they called it ELIs. They said, you're going to run ELIs. Well, most guys, I come to find out, that had been installers for very long, if there wasn't a lot of business, uh, or, you know, a lot of installations for a day, they would, they would say, okay, you're going to run ELIs today. Every tenured uh, installer, repairman, loved running ELIs because what that meant was they were going to go park and eat donuts all day and do nothing. And they would go maybe to 10 houses and bring back 10 phones of equipment left in those houses. And so, you know, there was no proof. We didn't have GPS. You know, we didn't have Siri back in that day. Man, you could hide. It was great. You know, you could just be as lazy as you wanted, you know. Well, I was a zealot, man. I'm like, man, I got this job. I, I, I got to prove myself. So one day I get ELIs because I'm the new guy. I, so I, what my job was, they gave me, they give you a stack of orders this big and say, you know, our records indicate that there are, are phones. And at that time, let's say a princess telephone was 150 160 bucks. They had all these fancy phones. And if those were left in, they wanted those back so they could replenish them and resell them. So it was important to the company. Well, so, so uh, the, the whole idea was, you know, you go to a house, somebody moved in, and those phones were left, and you take them out, and you bring them back. And you, you bring them back to the, uh, to the office where, you know, we all reported. Well, I went out that day, and guys, I'm not exaggerating. You know, we have those Southwestern Bell vans, you know. My van 
was like this. The back was loaded down. I was coming in. I could see all the installers going, oh, no, the new guy. Because I bet I had 150 phones, man. I worked a 10-hour day. I went into houses. I knocked on doors. I had, I had so many phones that the back of my truck, the shocks were down on it. And these guys got me over in a corner and said, what are you doing? I said, I did what they asked me to do. They gave me these orders, said, go get the equipment. I went and got it. And you know what? I raised the bar and let the boss know and the supervisors know, heck, anybody can go out and get this many phones. They didn't want that. I raised the bar, okay? When you raise the bar, you irritate people because you show them how weak they are. I didn't mean to. Guess what? I was just doing what I get paid to do. That's what they asked me to do. I, I work for the company. I think I ought to give the company a good day. We don't live that way anymore. Millennials want to do the least they can do for the maximum pay. I want what mom and dad have, but I don't want to work hard for it. That's not how it works, folks. So, people with a negative mindset have two choices. They can expect the worst and continually experience it, or they can change their thinking. How does a person learn the skill of possibility thinking? Here it goes. Stop focusing on, on all the things that go wrong. Stop focusing on all the things that go wrong. Number two, quit thinking about all the reasons something can't be done. Have you ever heard of somebody applying for a job and they ask what the bare minimum, what's, what's required of me? Why, why would you ask what's required of you? Instead of asking, why don't you ask, what are the possibilities for me in this company? What can I become? What do I have to do to become it? But most people look and say, what's required? If you only do what's required, you're average. People who are possibility thinkers always do more than what's required. The reason Michael Jordan was great, Michael did more than what was required. He definitely was not the most talented guy going into the NBA. He got kicked off his high school team. He thought differently. Caleb thought differently. You have to think differently. If you think differently, you'll work harder than people who think the way you used to think. And you'll become what they'll never become because you do what they'll never do. Now, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going out on a limb here because I'm just... You know, I love being older because you say things you'd never say when you're younger. But you know what? When, when I look around this room, I look and I go, how many men are sitting at home on their butt right now doing nothing and getting nothing because they're tired from a hard day at work? Well, you know, I worked eight hours today. Well, join freaking America or some of it. Give me a break. I'm tired. I promise you, you wouldn't be too tired to go pick up a Porsche if they had one at the Porsche dealership somebody paid for. I'm there. I'm just telling you guys, my great irritation is watching people complain about what they don't have and do nothing to get what they could have. Exhaust me. When I tell you guys on Sunday, make an investment in yourself, I'm telling you, you ought to be here because what I've said tonight already, if I quit right now, is life-changing. And it's not my material. I'm just teaching it. So I'm not taking credit for the brilliance of this. I worked with John Maxwell for years all over the world, one of the most brilliant leaders, and I sat under that leadership and began to get what he was saying. And now I'm repeating what he's saying. Now, a lot of this is mine, but the stories and illustrations, but the principles, guys, listen to me. These principles are life-changing. Do you know, you know, people are paying three and four thousand dollars to get this information I'm giving you tonight. That's what it's costing to get this kind of training. I met with a guy recently, said, Would you write a reference letter for me to get into leadership training at Maxwell Institute? And I said, Well, what's that look like? He said, Well, it costs about three to four thousand dollars. And I went, You gotta be kidding me. What you're getting tonight is gonna cost most guys three to four thousand dollars. And I can't get somebody to walk across the street. You see what I'm saying? You go to any self-improvement seminar or whatever, you go, I mean, you, any, you name it, and you're going to pay thousands of dollars to get, and, and we're offering it for free. How bad do you want it? 
Number two, quit thinking about all the reasons something can be. Number three, stay away from negative thinkers. The voices you listen to will become the choices you make. You say, well, they don't affect me. Yeah, they do. Negative words affect. How many of the ten spies that said we can't go in because we look like grasshoppers, who started that story? Which one of the tribes, which one of the ten started it and the other nine believed it? Which two saw it and said, man, we can't do this? And the fourth guy down the line went, well, until you said that, I thought we could. And then they come back and the majority, 10 out of 12, say we can't do it. And finally, one guy steps up named Caleb and says, we can. I'm not letting these negative thinkers keep me from what we've, we've walked around here for 40 years. And you're telling me I can't go in and do this now? Are you kidding me? We've been in the wilderness 40 years only to find out that what God told us we could have, we can't have. And yet for 40 years he's provided for us night and day and the sun and the heat. And now you're telling me we can't go in and get what he told us? This is how silly. I can make this story really silly. Because that's how silly it is to think that God would provide and their clothes didn't wear out and they were fed and, and good things happened. And now we're at the place of our promise. And because we have some negative thinkers, we're not going to go in. I'm done with that. I'd probably hit one of them in the mouth. If I'd have been Caleb, I would, I would have silenced him by hitting them in the mouth. I know that's not biblical, but back then it wasn't a Bible. So there wasn't any guidelines that said he couldn't. We know better today, but I'm not sure he knew better back then. Avoid experts. <laughs> Avoid a, Because experts will not take you from where you are to where you want to be. They'll tell you what they did. Experts tell you how, what they did, not how they did it. I'm an expert. I had a pastor once preach on this. He said, always be a green banana because green bananas have not ripened yet. The minute you get ripe, guess what's next? You rot. Stay a green banana. Always be learning. Keep learning. Keep growing. Look for possibilities in every situation, every crisis, every situation. Look for possibilities. When there's something before you, a mountain before you, ask yourself this question. Do I go buy the equipment to climb over it? Is there a way around it? Or is there a helicopter nearby? <laughs> I'm going to get on the other side of the mountain. Because it stands between me and what I have in my heart. The reason the world is depressed is because they have become hopeless. They've trusted what somebody else said, prophesied, doom. And they've become hopeless. Oh, folks, it's a fight for all of us. It's a fight for me every day, every week. Try running a nonprofit. That alone sounds negative. <laughs> I like profit. And I'm the leader of a nonprofit. You fight it. We don't have anything tangible to sell. We're not selling stuff. We're giving it away, believing that God will provide. That's what we do. And you know how many people don't do anything to help us? About 95% do nothing to help this church exist. If Barna Institute is correct in their survey, 90 to 95% do nothing to help. Take that home, put it in your pipe tonight, and smoke that. Because that's what I deal with every week. <laughs> okay, God, if we were a country club, you'd pay dues. And if you didn't pay them, you wouldn't get in. That's what they sell. Other people sell, 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 sell. We don't have anything to sell. And yet what we give every week is more life-changing than anything you will buy this week. Question traditional thinking. Question traditional thinking. 
That's why the Pharisees hated Jesus. He broke tradition. He healed on the Sabbath because people were more important than a day. He talked to a woman at the well who would become the first evangelist on his evangelistic team. Jewish men did not talk to Samaritan women, much less, didn't talk to women, much less Samaritan women. And yet Jesus said, I'm going to break tradition because this lady right here is going to go to town and tell everybody what I just told her. And she did. And she began a revival. Tradition has kept a lot of people from their potential. Number seven, find inspiration from great achievers. Negative people scorn great achievers because they're jealous. They'll criticize them because they're jealous. Find great achievers and get close to them. It might just rub off on you. But you have to humble yourself because pride will keep you from greatness. Pride will keep you from the right information. Pride will keep you from asking questions because you will be, you think you'll be perceived as dumb. I grew up that way, assuming I needed to know everything instead of I needed to know more than what I knew. And if you don't ask questions, you don't learn. Always try to be the dumbest guy in the room. It means you're around people who are smarter. And the reason for this gathering and these gatherings this spring, specifically for me, was to elevate your thinking. It's easy to come to church on Sunday morning at one of our worship experiences and spend an hour, hour and 15 minutes, if I'm really preaching good, an hour and 20, and just go home. Then I ask you this, what are you doing to take what you learned on Sunday and help someone else with it? Guys, let me tell you, I built a big church. I'm not here to build another one. This will be as big as God wants it to be, and that may be a big church. But I'm not here to build a big church. I'm here to build people into being big people. And if big people, if we grow into who we're called to be, increase the capacity in our soul, you can't help but grow big. When you start investing in other people and you start developing other people, increasing other people's capacity, and then they start increasing other people's capacity, you'll start a revolution and a revival that is unstoppable. That's what I'm here to do. And you know what? If it doesn't work, me and God are going to be just fine. But I'm going to be a little pissy from time to time. And I said that intentionally right here because I don't care anymore. I'm tired of being politically correct. But dadgummit, people need to get up off their butt and get something. And so, you know, I, 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 I'll tell you guys right now, I'm not here because I need to be here. I know this information. I'm not here because I want another night to speak. I'd just soon be home with my wife because I'm she's beautiful. You know it. You've seen her up here on Sunday morning. You used to look and go, I can't believe he got her. Neither can I. <laughs> I'm as in awe as you are. <laughs> but I'd just soon be with her. But you know what? I know what I'm called to do. I'm called to lift other people. I've traveled the world in different time zones and miserable conditions just to lift other people, make them believe they can do something that nobody ever told them they could do. That's who I am, and that's who I want you to be. And guys, let me tell you, if you're not doing anything at this church, then do something at a church. Dadgummit, you don't need to be sitting on your butt every week doing nothing. Now, I'm becoming a little bit of an old crotch right now, crotchety old man right now. Get off your booty and do something. Well, you know, we, we typically, we come to the 11 and then we go eat. Shame on you. Come to 930 and work. Worship at 11 and then go eat. 
Get mad at me. Go ahead. Get mad at me. Maybe you'll do something to show. Get mad at me. But I'm telling you guys, I'm not playing patty, cow, patty cake, and this ain't the Boy Scouts. This is the army of God. And we need to get on board, folks. And probably every one of y'all are doing something in here. At least that's my prayer. Because you're going to be mad at me if you're not. I ain't going back to that. He's like, got on to us. Yeah, I did. I ain't apologizing for it either. Let me tell you something. We got, we got work to do, folks, and I'm not the guy that's going to do it all. I'm going to do my part. We're going to all do our part. We'll see what God can do. So now that I've condemned you into something, fill these suckers out. Okay? I know it's not the right way to go, but it's Wednesday night. <laughs> I want to ask uh, Donnie, a couple guys, we're going to receive an offering. I'm going to pray. We haven't done this, but you know what? I felt like the Lord said, Mark, what are you believing for? I know that tonight we have the opportunity to be a blessing, opportunity to, uh, to, to help do some things we need to get done around here, folks. And we're going to get it done. Um, you know the drill. You can write a check and give cash, whatever. You can put an offering envelope, whatever you want to do. Or you can text to give 405-546-2226. It's up there. Um, whenever I find myself in a situation where I feel like I'm uh, struggling, if it's financially, I give my way out of it. If it's self-pity, I serve my way out of it. If it's discouragement, I encourage my way out of it. So I figure whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. If I don't want to be discouraged, I can wait on somebody to encourage me, or I can start encouraging somebody. And boy, if you wait on somebody to encourage you, you may be a lifetime before it happens. But if you start sowing encouragement, God will make sure you get encouraged. So the reality is, guys, whatever you want, activate it by doing it before you get it. Okay? Guys, go ahead and, and pass the buckets. If you guys need an ink pen, there should be one there to fill anything out. Just go ahead and pass them real quick. We're going to get out of here. It's 8.09. I told you guys, 7 to 8.15, and we're going to honor that. We've, uh, we've got a men's breakfast, guys, at the end of the month. I don't know how many of you have been or have not been. I, it's hard to tell. That's been a real successful Saturday for us. Um, we've got the men's breakfast at the end of this month, which ends up being April the 27th. Um, We've got another men's night, April the 24th, which is two weeks from tonight. And, uh, you know, guys, um, I really want to see this double, if not quadruple. You say, well, that, you know, that's a stretch. It's really not a stretch. It's just a matter of priorities. We always find the time to do the things we really want to do. So anybody says, well, I couldn't be there tonight. You know, I know some people are out of town, vacation. I get all that. Some people have to work. I get that. But I can promise you the grand majority of people that are not here tonight, it was not a priority for the majority. And, you know, I don't know about y'all, but, man, I, I don't ever want to settle in life. The thought of retirement probably scares me more than anything I've ever faced in my life. I just can't even imagine retiring. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to work as hard as I've always worked, but not doing nothing doesn't excite me for one minute. Got to be something to do. And there's a world that's dying, going to hell, and looking for what we have. Let's go after them, guys. Get to know people on Sunday morning. Don't just come in and sit down. Don't just come in and worship and leave. Get to know people. I want to challenge you. My dad was such an introvert. He'd hardly talk. He, just, he was a great, skilled man. But he, in his latter years, he finally got it. And he became one of these guys that everybody fell in love with. He had no idea that he would be as liked as he was because he was an introvert. Get out of your shell. Get to know people. Let's, let's do something great here, all right? Well, let's stand up, pray. Thank those of you watching online, all one and a half of you maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you say, well, what's a half? Fell asleep about 30 minutes in. <laughs> and they're still on. <laughs> let's pray. God, thank you, God, God so much for uh, the men that are here tonight. God, for the, the, uh, the wisdom of my friend John Maxwell and 
God, all that he's brought to my life. I pray a blessing on him tonight. Lord, pray for Pastor Jesse tonight, Lord, uh, and Jeanette. Jeanette's had surgery, guys. Let's just pray for her. Lord, I speak healing over Jeanette right now and strength over Pastor Jesse. And, Lord, uh, he'd be here tonight if it wasn't for that. And uh, well, I love that man, and I thank you for his passion, God. I pray that you'd heal his wife. Uh, Lord, as we go from here, help us to practice what we've written down and what we've learned tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great rest of the week.